Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon from, from Barcelona and welcome to a new uh, Rhino user webinar. This is Pedro here and today I'll be, I'll be present, uh, presenting this, this talk. Today we are going to see the uh, successful use of Rhino inside Revit in several architectural projects at uh, Modelical. Modelical is a global consultancy that focuses on uh, facilitating and inspiring changes in the AEC field helping it to become more efficient, agile, and, and modern. I'm glad to introduce Begoña, Belén, and Oscar, who are going are, are showing how they manage both geometry and, and information, and uh, how uh, Rhino Inside Revit allows them to, to design optimal workflows to get the most out of uh, Rhino and, and Revit. Begoña Gasso is head of product management, and Oscar Herrero and Beren Torres are computational design specialists. Uh, well, nothing, nothing else from my side. I let them start presenting and well, I'll, I'll be here in the chat collecting the questions you might have for them for the Q&A session, okay? So uh, whenever you want, guys. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, McNeil, for inviting us. And thank you, thank you very much, all of you, for, for you for joining to this session. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Uh, so, well, I, as Pedro has said, uh, we are Modelical, we are a, a global consultancy firm, and we try to make uh, our industry more efficient. And, and we, we managed to do this with Brian Insight, so thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, today I'll be I'll be doing just a brief uh, presentation of, of why do we use uh, Rhino Insight in our in our projects? Uh, bec um, uh, how how do we um, how do we translate uh, geometry from Rhino to Revit? Uh, uh, how do we do it right now, and uh, how uh, how um, how um, we usually uh, did that? And the most important part is that my colleagues uh, Oscar and Belen they they will be showing us two two examples. They are gonna do them very fast, and one is going to be about uh, translating geometry from Rhino to Revit, and the other one about transferring data. From Rhino to Revit to uh, automate the, to automate the modeling uh, di directly in Revit. Okay, so why do we need uh, Rhino in our projects? Um, well, uh, geometry uh, Revit has so many benefits, but one of them, one of the biggest challenges we find when when modeling complex projects is the rigidity the, we find in the system families. Uh, as you may know, as you might know, um, there are uh, we have um, adaptive uh, component components in the for for modeling external families, but when we are dealing with uh, system families, uh, Revit is much more uh, limited. Limited and well, we also find so many uh, constraints when developing component uh, families and, and mostly when trying to join uh, complex uh, complex geometry elements. The joinings are really hard in 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 Revit. Um, as I said before, the system families are quite uh, quite. Uh, Limited in Revit, so you can imagine uh, how difficult it is to make um, non-regular gaps in in these in these elements. And um, some some um, some geometries that are very hard to do in in Revit are non-regular are the ones with non-regular distributions or the ones that have non-parallel surfaces. These are really really hard and. Uh, the development of complex to, uh, topographical surfaces or geometry with organic shapes. These are really, really difficult. So, uh, so as you can see, we can find so many arguments to try to, uh, <laughs> to, try to have uh, all the benefit that we can find when modeling in Rhinoceros 
um, in our project, in our Revit projects. So we have has uh, we we have had this problem since 2015, more or less. Uh, at least I remember, I remember it. Um, so, but and so we have been trying to 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 manage uh, this problem. Uh, since since different uh, perspective and different workflows, and I thought that it it uh, for sure now we have Rhino Rhino inside, which let us um, uh, solve this problem uh, solve solve all this problem uh, yeah, more easy more easily. But um, uh, there are like so so there are other workflows that might that might be interesting for for some specific problems. So, um, so first of all, when we started to import uh, geometry from Rhino to Revit, we used to do it just as a reference element. Uh, we imported uh, the uh, DVG or SAT files into Revit. And then we use it just as a as a reference element. And when if you do if you guys do this uh, anytime, you have to be very careful. And we we suggest not to import the, this type of geometry into Revit just to link it. If you're gonna delete it, it's best to it is best uh, a best practice to to delete uh, to link it. And then when you have used it, uh, you should delete it and you should be careful when linking it just to a floor plan or just to a view, not to the, mo the whole model. These are just best practices. Um, another typical workflow for, uh, for importing geometry is to import the, this geometry into an, an in-place mass uh, model in Revit and then convert it to Revit's native elements, such as uh, roofs, floors, or walls. Then um, a very typical workflow is to import the geometry into an external family in Revit. So you have all the geometry uh, control. And, and if you don't import the geometry that, uh, directly into Revit, we have some other uh, plugins that help us to do it. Uh, one of them is Rhinamo, um, which, uh, which is now, I think, Conveyor that help us to translate the, the geometry from Rhino to, to Revit, but with its own workflow. So you have to has the, you need this, the, this plugin. And other plugins that are also very useful are Speckle that they work as a external database. So with Grasshopper, you can, with, with Grasshopper, you, you just uh, um, transfer the, all the data to, to model the, the, the geometry di directly into Revit, into Revit with, with Dynamo, for instance. So Flux, Flux or, 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 Spe or Speckle is just an external database. And for sure, you can use the, the interchange uh, format file IFC, uh, for instance, working with Visual Arc uh, plugin. OK. But um, so with. Um, we have been working in so many in so many projects uh, using Rhino inside, but uh, I wanted to show to you this uh, the Santiago Bernabéu st Stadium that when when we started um, this project uh, Rhino inside didn't exist. So for for modeling the, the, the existing conditions of the of the stadium. Uh, we we use uh, all these workflows that I was showing you uh, just before, but uh, since this project uh, has been um, is uh, is like a two or three years uh, old project now uh, we have been using Rhino Insight to model some of some of the elements of the of, of the facades. Uh, we have we have we have found really really useful the the. Um, the the flexibility that Rhino Insight uh, has has given us to develop uh, such a complex uh, geometry, and and also other type of <laughs> um, of project that are that um, are very hard to do without <laughs> Rhino Insight are uh, 
all the projects with very complex geometries or with uh, a very big scale. So you have to repeat the same element in many, in, in many, in many, in many objects in Revit or some project that that really needs uh, a lot of precision in the in the geometry or that the fabrication or, or that the fabrication is really is really complex so um these are the type of projects that we usually that um that we usually use with that that we usually develop with Rhino Insight. And now my, my colleague, Oscar, he's gonna show you an example so you are gonna understand it much better. Okay. Thank you, Bego. Thank you. So... Let me share my screen now. Yeah. So now, now you can see the presentation, right? So um, now I will explain you a little bit uh, some examples of our workflow. Uh, in this case, with a with a dummy project, uh, the the Rolex Center. But you can imagine that that this same workflow with some specification uh, can be can be applied to almost every complex project that that we have done. And, and also in the in the future. So, for this example, let me share uh, Revit now. Um, we well, I will I will present just three three parts of the of the exercise or, or three examples. Uh, the the first one uh, is is about the mod the modeling of the columns. All this this project, the the Rolex Center project comes from from Rhino. If I show you the the Rhino screen, you will see that uh, the model is directly uh, modeled here from from some sketches like like to the plans or or to the section. So we have created the 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 mass in in Rhino to transfer it to to Revit as as a mass and then create uh, roof by walls. Uh, Root by face, sorry. Um, as you can see here, so uh, the the first example here uh, will be the creation of uh, the columns. In this case, is so simple, so I will cover it uh, quickly. Uh, in this case, we we have some points in the in the um, in the Reno model. So here we have the the location of the columns. It could be also blocks or or wherever uh, it doesn't matter the 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 main part of all of this workflow so usually is covered in 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 grasshopper about how to get the geometry how to um, uh, isolate the the important information and then transfer it to to revit so in this case i have all the points so with some simple uh, exercise, I get the the intersection with the with the roof, well, with the slabs, and and then by getting the the intersection, all the points, I get the final line, and then directly transfer it to 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 a column, uh, a set of columns in in Revit. Okay, this is so simple. So I don't I don't want to to spend a lot of time explain explain that. So um, this this is the kind of example that that we usually we 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 usually use uh, running inside and and is quite simple. Um, a next step in in complexity and I will stay a, a little bit um, uh, further in in this example is about creating the, the the panels in this case the the courtyard panels because uh, the rest of the of the panels as the wall is straight uh, is it can be easily done with a with a curtain wall uh, by face uh, using the 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 mass the, the mass face but about the the courtyard that is not possible because um, the resulting curtain wall uh, will be will be facetated. So in this case, instead of 
of using the curtain wall uh, by face, we use uh, uh, adaptive panels based on uh, a set of six points, okay, in order to create the, the, curtain, wall, the, the curtain panels, and then uh, a structural framing to create the emulsions. Okay, so that uh, those both parts will be will be covered in the in in this in this session. So first of all, um, getting the 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 courtyards here. So here we have all the the courtyards in plan. So we get the geometry. Uh, we intersect. Well, we divide by a certain length. In this case, uh, we create lines about uh, those those division and then intersect with the um, with the labs um, a little bit of of um, maths in terms of getting the, the 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 points in the middle instead of of the higher and the and the lower one so we get just uh, the set of points and then um, by by getting the 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 sets of, of points, we get the list. What is the 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 main task or what is the the main advantage of use uh, right inside in this workflow? Uh, in in my opinion, and and uh, that could be discussed. But in my opinion, the best uh, part of 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 Grasshopper in this workflow is the the possibility of of visual debug uh, the list. For example, using here uh, the the path label component from the from the Wombat plugin is so easy to get. For example, the the paths of uh, each panel. In this case, we are using uh, Loft uh, to create them directly in in Rhino, but also we are using the same lines. Uh, here these lines to create to extract the points as you can see here so for example by getting the the um, the path label and, and grafting it uh, we can we can display easily the path of its point so with a quick review we can we can be sure that that we have all the points uh, correctly sorted so everything will work uh, in in Revit. So in this case, for me, it's, it's, it's quite quite useful to use this kind of uh, visual debug. So then we add the adaptive component. Uh, and just with uh, a little bit of, of processing the, the path label or, or the, yeah, the path of its element, of its uh, panel, we can set the the name uh, of its panel in order to also to have it uh, control in order to to fabrication in order to to measurement whatever we need we have the the correct identity of its panel so for example let me show it uh, in in Revit uh, here we have the the this parameter uh, mod element ID in which we have used Courtyard with a number of, of of the cord of the courtyard and the number of the panel P and the and the panel. So here we have all the elements currently named in order to have that control. So if we want to schedule, if we want to to export it to fabrication, uh, whatever we need, we can we can easily identify its panel. Also, we have the 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 element ID by Revit, but that ID is not is not easily identified with the with the with the element itself. Uh, with this information, for us, is is so easy. For example, if we have a, a Excel schedule or or, or a spreadsheet uh, with the with the measurement of the elements or whatever, uh, it's so easy to to identify its element. And finally, we will have uh, another example. In this case, with emulsions. In which uh, uh, I want to, to show you, also um, taking into account uh, how to debug, uh, visually debug uh, the the information. Um, 
in this case, if we set by default the, the, the mullions, let me go back to Revit, uh, for example, well, all the, the, the mullions uh, will be placed um, oriented to the, to the X and Y axis. Uh, not rotated to the to the to the courtyard. Uh, so in Grasshopper, with uh, a little bit of maths, we get all the points. Let me go back to the uh, floor plan. So we get the 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 points. We also uh, get uh, the reference uh, angle in this case, the, the y angle, and also the tangent of each point at the, at the curve. So here we have both vectors. With, with those vectors, we get the angle. Uh, also with the cross product, we can, we can check uh, the angle in the same direction because you know that Grasshopper gets the, the sorted angle. So depending on, on the orientation, uh, you will have uh, the angle clockwise or counterclockwise. So uh, with the cross product, we get uh, the correct angle and, and, and the expression here. Uh, and also uh, we can, in order to be sure that we are using the, the correct angle, the correct orientation, we can create uh, visually um, the, the, the arc that we are using. Also, if we want, we can display, for example, the, the tag, so we can use text tag uh, in order to show that uh, the, the angle is whatever uh, we need. For example, the angle here, as you can see, we can we can check that the angle, well, in this case is in, in radians, we can use two degrees. So here we know that, that we are using always the angle in the same direction. Also, it's important to know that, that um, Revit and Rhino or, or Grasshopper uh, counts the angle in the in the opposite direction. So in, uh, we have to 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 use the negative in 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 that way. So anyway, uh, with all of this information, we can create the mullions and then orient them. So here we write the cross section rotation parameter in in Revit with the resulting of the expression that we have uh, used uh, to calculate the angle. So the final result is that we have all our mullions correctly oriented. So um, in this case, we have uh, properly modeled with, with uh, an easy workflow. If we, in the past that, 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 that we usually uh, use this workflow in, in Dynamo, for sure can be done all of this uh, with, with no problems, but uh, we miss uh, this, this kind of tools that help you in the, in the workflow to get the, the, the correct result and with the less effort possible. So um, I think that that, that addition is, is one of the, of the, of the best advantage of using of using Grasshopper in the in the in the in, in the workflow for uh, complex projects. And now um, Belen will show you uh, a little bit further about uh, getting information into into Revit. Um, can I share the whole screen? Sure. You have to select a, a um, screen. Okay. <laughs> Not I'm as used to Zoom, sorry. Uh, okay. Mm. Perfect. Oh. Uh, so my part is uh, about um, data transfer. So in this case, it's very simple geometries, but uh, with a lot of data embedded. And in this part of the session, we will share our workflow um, 
well just apart uh, that we do supporting a Spanish constructor construction company that they apply the so-called design for manufacturing and assembly in the context of the Spanish AC industry. So it's a wood, wood construction company and they use a structural cross laminated timber. And this allows you to know how much each element of the building costs, how long it takes to manufacture in, and all the design specifications and requirements that, that we need. Um, so with offsite construction, uh, you can save a lot of time, mostly, uh, but also you, you can do for the planning, costing, and uh, uh, facilitate a lot of manufacturing and assembly. So each fabrication process must be predefined, and there are hundreds of components in a building, so um, hundreds of walls that uh, they need to be individualized on the factory. And each one of them ha has an assembly order parameter that defines when will it go on site. So in, in this case, I will do a demo for an automation we developed for paneling the uh, fire protection panels um, of a prefabricated wall for manufacture. And the geometric operations that we perform are based on um, the industry, the specific industry paneling guidelines that could be, for instance, the maximum panel dimensions, the orientation of the panels, the uh, U and B uh, directions, and the reference vector of the of the face of the B rep well, of, or, or the face of the wall. So it says where we are starting paneling, in which direction, which is the reference face, and uh, for, for instance, the rule could be using, using as much as possible complete panels without cutting, or distributing uh, staggered joints and avoid that, avoiding coincident joints between one layer and the, and the other one, and foreseeing and adding a special width panels on site for allowing, for instance, wall joints to be registrable, etc. So this routine allows, uh, for, for example, reading the thickness of each layer of uh, fire protection panel and all the data it's embedded in the that it's embedded in the parent element it's tra transferred to to the to the geometry that we end up sending to to revit uh, so we can perform geometric operations and analyze um, analyze the result in order to mark elements with parameters that will later on inform the both the manufacturing process and the assembly process. So, uh, for example, we we made this automation in a manner that uh, so that you can fit it with four walls or four million walls. It doesn't matter because you run it in sequence in order not to collapse uh, Revit when receiving the massive geometry and data at the same time. So we experienced uh, grasshopper performing geometrical operations faster than Revit can instantiate them or receive the data and the geometry together. So when Revit is instantiating a, a geometry, grasshopper is already in the next iteration. So sometimes some geometry and data are missing. Um, <clears throat> so this is our workflow. Uh, it starts with a Revit model, and we fit the model with metadata. Meta so it, the model has parameters, but, but also we fit, we fit it with metadata. And then we read the metadata with Rhino inside Revit and Grasshopper, and we produce these geometrical operations, which, which is the panelization, and then transfer the geometry and data back to the Revit model. And then we export it to EF, IFC, and then in this case, we have the we end up with a model at LOD 4, 450, 
which uh, with all its fabrication parts uh, ready to be sent to in this case cut work uh, for manufacturing which is a 3d cut cam software for timber construction so yes i will show how we do this um, panelization in a minute and this is a a bit of a bit of a explanation of of the how do we add the metadata to the model uh, instead of using parameters for everything for example the umb directions of the wall uh, that uh, or or the correct uh, perpendicular vector for the for the reference phase of the wall so it tells you which is the interior and which is the exterior that will affect the order of the layers. So uh, instead of uh, um, uh, adding a lot of parameters, we use the uh, Revit extensible storage. Uh, so we put in, inside, for example, you can see here the local origin of each wall and the local co coordinates and the reference vector. and and etc. You can fill it with whatever you want. Um, so uh, the inputs are elements with attributes and metadata associated with each element. And the output, it's panels in Revit with attributes or parameters. <clears throat> then I already explained how, how we perform this reading of the data of uh, the Revit model, and we have to be sure that we receive all the geometry properly uh, to to perform our our operations. Also, this routine um, detects and marks panels with non-manufacturer non-manufacturer dimensions. For example, if we have a strip which is um, too too thin, it's not possible to to manufacture, so uh, we we make a redistribution um, by adding, in this case, uh, a third of a panel before the error. Then we check the output, and if it's valid, we send it to Revit. Uh, if it's not valid yet, or if the problem has moved to another place, we we iterate the redistribution until we don't get any man non manufacturable panel. So um, this is uh, the summary of the workflow. So we have a Revit geometry. Then, well, I will do the demo and then go back to this slide maybe. <clears throat> so in this case, you see we have uh, four walls, or, well, five walls with openings and we have a layer of uh, CLT and then this um, layer which is the fire protection uh, panel or layer and what we do first is to to fit the to fit the script with the geometries um, in this case um, you can do it with filters and well i will do it really manually let me see i will show the geometries <clears throat> i will erase this <clears throat> we see the four geometries that i can select one by one I will do it. One, two, three, four, and five elements. We get the geometry, well, the geometries. And then after we have the inputs that we can, we can modify, for example, panel height, panel width, um, if we have registers at the beginning or at the end in each layer, the minimum strip uh, width 
and if the for instance if the world has the two fire protection panel layers or not and just single layer and the panel thickness of each layer then <clears throat> um, we perform all this paneling and then we filter the geometries, the, the output geometry by um, analyzing the dimensions that we, we, we get at the end. So for example, if we, we need to mark the pieces that are half panel or less than half panel, or the pieces that are dintel panels that need, need to be cut in both directions, or for example, uh, in the case of uh, something um, related to design happens and due to, per, for example, the opening position inside a wall, um, there is no way of getting rid of this number of factor variable panels, then we just mark it for the designers to, to take a decision. Um, yeah, and, well, once we filter the, the geometries, then here we have the part in which we send the geometry to, to Revit. And then, mm, for example, all these parameters that, that will be sent together with the geometry. So for example, here we are reading um, parameters coming from, from the parent element. So we read and we write. And then some other parameters that are generated depending on, on the, uh, the layer that we are working on that you can, you can decide. It does, uh, it's not related uh, with the parent geometry or nor with the geometrical uh, conditions of the output panels. It's just something that you want to add. Uh, and it's very custom customizable. And then other parameters that could come for a from a database, for example, a database of materials. Um, and yeah, and this is the parameter that it's generated depending on the geometrical conditions. So once uh, in this case, I have uh, one toggle which is connected. Well, from paneling, yes. Um, one toggle that is con connected to the generating the geometry, but also to it. It enables the writing all the data at the same time. So once you hit run, you generate the the geometry in Revit, but also you you inform it with all these parameters. Um, I erased already the, the panels. And for example, we have we can have uh, walls, intersecting walls affecting the, the panels. For example, you have a wall that that uh, interrupts the fire protection because it has another fire protection layer. So it, you have to cut it. So it will be a perforating geometry as well as and the, and the openings as well. So you can, for example, have all the, all the perforators or all the openings, but also you can filter them with the, this metadata um, in this case, we are reading the specific perfor perforators that affect one wall. Uh, this is very useful because now we just have five walls, but if we have four million, if you, if you perform this operation with one wall against uh, 10 million openings, so the, it, it's very expensive computationally. So in this case, we have just the one wall and the, and the perforators uh, affecting it. Um, and that's it, let's run it. Um, 
and paneling, yes. I will take this off and send it to Revit, yes. So the first, I will leave it running. So it's time I change, uh, this is the item selection. So the, from my list of um, these five walls, I take one by one the wall that I want to um, panelize. Otherwise, I I use this routine on which I feed the here I put my the list of all the walls of the project, and then I I run it, so it it goes one by one, uh, doing this this process. In this case, I will do it just just one by one. So I leave it running and then I move the slider and it should instantiate yes, all the next wall, next wall. So if you do this without Revit, this is faster. <laughs> the, thinking th the thinking icon is because of Revit. Uh, and then yes, we can we can check that we receive the the parameters and the geometry. So it's a generic model, and it has all these um, parameters that we uh, we fit it with. So it's an offsite panel, for example. This is on site. Uh, uh, this needs a cut in width and height. This is a full panel, so it doesn't need a cut. This is half panel, uh, th uh, things like that. Um, yes, I will go back to the presentation. So what, what we have is one Revit geometry and attributes that come from, from it. And we go to Rhino inside Revit and we generate a new geometry and we fit it with these attributes coming from the parent geometry and attributes coming from the paneling routine. Uh, so this geometrical analysis and additional attributes like I told you, the um, material, thickness, what, whatever we want to add it to the geometry and then we transfer everything to Revit, but it's native, which is very important. It's native uh, Revit geometry with all this data. And thank you all for, for your attention <laughs> and to Pedro and Magnil for, for letting us share our work today. Thank you very much. Guys, uh, well, I think it's been a, a really nice presentation, really inspiring. I'm uh, pretty sure that the attendants enjoyed the presentation as much as, as I did. Uh, we have here several questions. Let's let's start with a QA and a uh, session. And I'll start uh, with a question from Juliana Santo um, for Oscar, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you include the number of each element ID manually or as you build the data is populated automatically? Yeah, the, the workflow is completely automatic. So in, in this case, uh, as we don't have any kind of uh, naming requirements or something like that, we use, we use directly the, the path of each element uh, to fill the, to fill the, the, the ID. So let me quickly share my screen and I will show you. Um, so here that we have the, the, the tree path, uh, the first uh, element of the path refers to the, um, to the courtyard. So for example, when I saw, well, not this one, uh, this one here, um, let me turn this off. Uh, it's courtyard. Uh, as it comes from from Macure, uh, has the the first um, element of the of the path uh, for its its courtyard, and then the second one 
to each element. So just with uh, a simple addition of the of the name of each um, part of the of the ID, uh, we directly populate it into into Revit automatically. Okay, and uh, how did you get the, the middle point in the adaptive component family panel to match the, the opening curves? Uh, yeah. Curvature? Uh, well, it's, it's quite simple because, uh, first of all, I divide the curve uh, by the length of the panels. So then I shatter the, the segments in order to get each, sec each segment uh, uh, by parts. And then, uh, again, divide each, sec each segment into, into two parts. So we have three points by each segment. So in that way, we use uh, those groups of three points in order to create the lines. In instead of doing it at the end um, by dividing uh, the curve uh, and then trying to get the, the middle point, uh, moving it to the beginning of the workflow uh, make it easier. A uh, more generic question. Uh, Elam Gabuli asks you if uh, for topolo uh, topographical surfaces, if uh, have you tried lens design, uh, the, the terrain, terrain tools so, of, mm. of this software? We, we know the, the, the tool we have, we have tried uh, in, some, in some specific project, but it's not uh, one of our uh, everyday, everyday tools, but we know yeah. it. Okay, Daniel Depot asks if uh, could you share more information on how Revit extensible storage is used? Uh, I guess it's for me. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm, well, you, you can use it or not. It's just a decision on putting a lot of parameters on it or, or just ha uh, having hidden. Uh, but you can you can you can put whatever you want inside in this case we we with a with Dynamo and a python node we we write uh, this well we put inside the extensible storage a json object which at the end is a dictionary with each world and all these uh, coordinate systems local coordinate systems and and this kind of data it's very documented in the in, on the on the internet so i didn't extend my presentation on this part i focused on the grasshopper part mm -hmm. but it's very interesting indeed yeah D daniel wants to know as well if uh, the dot btl files if they are um, created via catwalk or in rhino uh i don't understand the question uh, he said i see that you are also using btl files mm, no 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 okay so yeah. do you use catwalk in some in some way or no we just send the model to the construction company well the ifcs and then they do to open it directly with cut work, but we don't use cut work. So okay. they just take the geometry while the the IFCs and open open them with cut work to check that every uh, parameter is correct and the geometry is oriented properly for cutting, for example, and, and mm -hmm. with tolerances mm -hmm. and these kind of things. But we don't we don't go into cut work. Okay. Uh, Juan Diego Vargas, uh, does this workflow work having both uh, windows and doors? I think this is for you as well, uh, Belen. The question is? Does this workflow work having both windows and doors? The yes, of course. Yes, yes, yeah. of course. Okay, Borja Balbastre, can wall be created by faces directly in the software using mass faces? Uh, I have tried uh, using, using C sharp, uh, but uh, I think that, that some parts of the, of the mass uh, workflow is not working yet, 
or 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 at least when when I tried, because because the same mass uh, directly created to 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 Revit can be can be created, but then you cannot use that mass mm -hmm. to create uh, wall by face, for example. But if you import manually the the mass, you can use it. So I think there is some some work in progress uh, functionality about about the the massing uh, feature. Okay, and with the paneling process, this will uh, create a lot of generic families. So how does this affect the performance in Revit? Um, the, the family itself is just is just one, but I mean, we are not creating a, a specific families. You are, we are using the adaptive component. So in that way, uh, about performance is not is not uh, hugely hugely uh, affected. Uh, could could be affected a little bit in in low performance computers, but at least in in our in our computers is not affecting at all, and and we are using really huge models in the, in that way. So um, no problems at at the at the end of the day. I think this question has uh, or can be answered as well by by Belen Belen. The same say, one, yeah. yeah. The, the, the creation of uh, different paneling uh, panel, panels, um, do you think that this can affect the, the performance in Revit? Mm. You, uh, I guess you mean having a lot of uh, panels in Revit, a, a massive geometry in Revit. Uh, yeah, I think because of the paneling process, you, you have to find all the uh, zones. As I, I run it in sequence, so it doesn't collapse at all. I try to do it uh, at the same time, like hundred, hundred of uh, walls and crashes. But I've seen, I've realized it's from the Revit side when I open the Grasshopper mm -hmm. um, definition uh, outside Revit, it it can do it uh, properly. But it's when you send the geometry. Yeah, massively. Maybe something can be improved there. I just realized the the question from before. I I was using BTL files. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a misunderstanding. I think it, BTL are my my initials, and I just okay. saw BTL is as well a design to machine format. <laughs> so I'm not using BTL. <laughs> Files are <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, hi, Belen. Can you share some documentation or blogs that uh, backs up your method? Mm, unfortunately, not because, uh, well, uh, we have an NDA with, with the company. I just shared the, uh, the geometric part of the process, but um, I cannot share. Okay. My process. I think more that... than that. Yeah, I think that answer the the question of uh, from Andres C that is is asking a, a course uh, where he could follow for the paneling iteration with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, more questions. Juan Diego Vargas has another one. I asked about the windows and doors because normally they are hosted by one wall at the same time. So they don't make a, a hole in two or three of them. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, how do you handle this issue? Because in your workflow, you are using the file protection as an extra wall, or it's just one extra layer. It's one extra layer. OK. Yeah. Also, uh, take into account that that uh, in that workflow that that Belen is showing, um, the modeling process is simplified in the way that instead of using complex wall that you can uh, as you can use in in uh, uh, a normal project, uh, in this case they are using simplified walls, so with no layers, with 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 nothing, 
nothing else that that the, just the the geometry of the world, and then you panelize it. So it's it's a, a little bit different than the than the current workflow that that we can find in any architecture mm -hmm. project, right, Belen? Yeah, that's correct. But uh, I cannot share more details about it. But uh, that's uh, that that's related to the LOD 450 which you don't have one wall, but you have all the parts for fabrication. Okay, any other question? Before closing up the session? Mm. Okay, Borja has another one. In case of using complex geometries in a project, do you always try to solve them by using native uh, Revit elements or sometimes direct shape elements can be employed? Uh, mm, direct shape should be should be avoid <laughs> as long <laughs> as you can. Uh, in terms that um, usually the the right hand side part of of the of the workflow uh, is not um, is not really spread. Uh, through all the stakeholders of the of the project, so it's important to keep uh, with native geometry in order to when 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 other uh, stakeholder enters into the project, uh, probably uh, he will need to modify something or to move it or whatever to to modify in some way the the geometry. Uh, so if you are using direct shape, that editability. Is limited in the in the future. So, also, also it's important about the about the performance. But um, the most important thing is about the the editability uh, for for other people. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, Begoña, Belen, Oscar. Thank you for your time, for, for your amazing presentation. And um, well, uh, for the audience, uh, you know that this uh, recording is going to be available for, for all, of, all of you in our uh, Rano User Webinar playlist in, in YouTube, okay? So nothing else. Thank you very much again and see you in the next videos. Thank you. Thank you. See, see you, you and thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.